It's not a matter of if, but when the next disaster will unexpectedly happen. Uh, being it related to hardware failure, human error, or atmospheric causes, which unfortunately are becoming more and more frequent. Planning for disasters, being prepared for when they occur, reacting properly and promptly in order to restore operations in the shortest, in the shortest time possible and with minimal data loss, should be the premise of any business risk uh, strategy. We might, we might uh, not open shop without it. Postgres, thanks to its continuous backup, point-in-time recovery, as well as stream replication, operates in business continuity envi environments with low recovery point objective and recovery time objectives. Good afternoon, my name is Gabriele Bartolini and today I will be talking to you about one component of a business continuity solution for PostgreSQL databases um, using an open source tool called Barman. The talk is, um, I will be moving if you don't mind, the talk is organized in four parts. One is a, the first one is an introduction to Barman because I didn't know how many of you already used it. The second, the second part um, gives an overview of the main features. The third part, because I, I, I was requested to focus on this, covers some important case studies for Barman and Postgres actually. And the last part, uh, we'll try to outline the new features that we, are tr that we want to develop and put into, into Barman. So I'll start with, a, with an history of Barman. Um, since I joined Second Quadrant in 2008, I've always been in desperate need for a tool that was capable of managing both backup and recovery of Postgres databases. Can you hear me over there? Okay. Um, we had several customers coming from Oracle and they all had our man in mind and they couldn't accept custom scripts. So uh, it's, unacceptable, it's not accept acceptable that in Postgres we have to use custom scripts. Fortunately in 2001 in preparation for a conference organized by Second Quadrant and called Char 11 clustering high availability and replication organized in, in July, um, we conceived the idea of writing an open source tool for managing both backup and recovery. Thanks to uh, a few customers and two of them were facing a, a large migration from Oracle, we were able to write a prototype um, of Barman and also thanks to uh, funding from a, from a, from a European uh, research project called Forecast, we, we were able to release the first stable version of Barman in 2012. Now we are, uh, we just came out with Barman 140, which is the 13th version of Barman, which means that every quarter pretty much we are releasing a new feature, a, a new version. Barman is written in Python. Uh, it requires you to accept the GNU GPL license, GNU GPL3 license, and Second Quadrant maintains packages for both Red Hat and Ubuntu Debian Linux. Uh, we support and test Postgres from 8.3 onwards, and uh, currently it is only based on rsync over SSH. When developing and actually conceiving Barman, we've always had three principles in mind. The first one is integration. Integrate with existing components and solutions of a in, in a business. Then uh, focus on uh, developing an intuitive user interface and configuration mechanism for, for, 
for usability reasons and automate Barman, I mean this tool, in as far as backup, monitoring and recovery are concerned. We believe that these three are, are the most important components of, of a disaster recovery solution. As the, the previous talk outlined, I want to uh, introduce some backup types. Barman supports hot, full, physical, continuous, inc and incremental backup. So it's a, it's a physical backup solution. It doesn't support logical backup yet, um, which is, you know, essentially a snapshot of a database at one, one instant. And it's done usually through pgdump and pgdump all. But there's also an open source project called PG Backman that um, allows you to um, keep track of logical backups. Physical backups in Barman rely on two concepts, essentially. Continuous wall archiving and base backups. These are concepts that even though Barman hides them from you, we always recommend uh, at least studying them on the documentation or take one of our courses. Because having an understanding of, of how things work underneath will help you un understand better Barman and also the architectures that you can implement with it and with Postgres. With Barman, we can back up uh, the minimum, I mean, the minimum information unit that we can back up with Barman is a PostgreSQL server. <laughs> Unfortunately, we cannot back up a single table. We cannot, we cannot back up a single database. Uh, table spaces are transparently backed up by Barman. And when it comes to recovery, we can also specify a different location for each table space. When we talk about disaster recovery, we have to uh, briefly introduce two main concepts called, two main metrics actually and measures. They're called RPO, recovery point objective, and RTO, recovery time objective. Let's consider a very uh, simple scenario for disaster recovery. This is the most simple scenario you can have. You have a master server here and the backup server there. Um, <coughs> in terms of recovery point objective, which is the amount of, of um, data you can afford to lose, we already have a quite optimal value for the majority of the cases. Um, PostgreSQL continuously sends wall files to the Barman server in this case. And so the, the maximum amount of uh, information you can, you can lose is a 16 megabyte uh, file of transaction. I mean, depending on the workload, it could be even more. But at the moment, with, with uh, wall archiving, this is what the amount of uh, data you can lose. With Postgres, you can also configure that through the archive timeout uh, configuration option, but even with the simple uh, configure with the simple configuration, you can uh, have a very good value of recovery point object. However, when it comes to recovery, the recovery time is the worst you can have because you don't have an uh, when a disaster happens. You need to um, restore a new server, reinstall uh, the operating system, uh, reinstall Postgres, and recover uh, the backup data. So the recovery time is very high. But depending on, on, on your business, it could be uh, a very uh, a suitable um, solution. So it, it all depends on, on assessing RPO and RTO. 
So there's no one, one solution fits, fits all. Okay, it, it all depends on, all, on your requirements. This could be um, quite, uh, could work quite well for you. A basic disaster recovery solution involves the, the, the addition of a, of a node for recovery. So this way, you still have a very low RPO, and you can reduce the RTO um, from, from low to a, very, to a high value, depending on the size of the backup. So for instance, you have a, your backup continuously taken here, and you have a recovery node that is once a week, for example, synchronized with the latest, uh, with the latest backup. So the recovery time is just a matter of reapplying wall files from the latest backup to uh, the, the start of the server. The a good thing of this solution is that if you plan and if you are prepared for it, you can measure that. And of, of course, you know that backup works. And you have people uh, continuously testing in your team that the backup works and they, they, are, they get familiar with, with the procedure itself. Remember, a backup that is not tested is not a backup. You can have all the backups you want, mm -hmm. but if you don't test them, they're useless. And let's, let's, um, let's go through a very basic business continuity, continuity solution for Postgres. This is a very typical and cost-effective solution that brings down the recovery time and which is based on high availability as well because disaster recovery focuses mainly on RPO. High availability is more focused on reducing RTO, mainly bringing it to zero. And that depends on the uptime that you require, that your business requires you to set as a DBA or as a, or as a database architect. With this very simple solution, you can achieve fantastic results in, term, in terms of business continuity. It's very simple, but it's effective. <coughs> so let, let's see some of the major features of Barman. So it's not a coincidence that both backup and recovery are part of uh, the name of Barman. Can you guess why? Well, you've got to get the data back. Otherwise, why back it up? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's not what I, what I, want, to, <laughs> what I want to say. It's only through a successful recovery that your backup can be considered valid. If you don't recover, you can't say that that backup works. So this has always been the assumption when we designed Barman. So the name recovery must be, uh, the word recovery must be in the name of the, of the software. And this actually led to an architectural choice when we designed Barman. We wanted to have a separate server for Barman because in the simplest scenario, you could use that server for recovery. Imagine you have only two servers, and if the master goes down, in an emergency situation, you can restore the server on that node, <coughs> on the backup node. It's an emergency situation, but it Again, it depends on uh, your cost um, evaluation and also um, your allowance, your budget. So that's why having a separate server led to allowing opera uh, remote operations in Barman for both backup and recovery. So we wanted to work remotely. 
since the, the conception. Also, working remotely allowed us to concentrate more server backups on, on a single backup server. Mm. Any comments? I'm reading your mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that can be considered a single point of failure. Okay. However, it's not a primary failure. Having the this backup server down will generate issues, that's for sure. Will generate actions to take after, you know, reactions. However, you want, you want uh, experience a downtime, unless, you, of course, you don't react. In that case, for example, the PostgreSQL uh, disk can fill up with wall files and it eventually stops. You will have to react, as I said, but it's not a primary failure. Also, you can have your backup file, your Bauman files backed up on another disk in the cloud or on tapes. And we are working on adding geo-redundancy into Bauman and uh, import and export facilities and also S3 storage uh, support. But the, I, I mean, this is my opinion. The, the coolest feature of Barman is the backup catalog. With the backup, backup catalog, let's say you, you, you take a weekly backup every Saturday. Over time, you generate um, weeks, months of, of data. Of, so you can, you can restore at any point of time within this range. And Barman keeps separated backups, which are like milestones, you know, like little flags that you can put it on, on the history of your PostgreSQL server, separates backups from the wall archive, which is a con continuous stream of wall files from the first available backup to the latest that's just been shipped. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with how recovery works, but basically when we want to recover at any point in time, we have to start from the closest, hopefully. I mean, you can start even from a, an older backup, but let's say you have to recover, at, recover to this moment here. You take the, this physical backup, you copy that into another server, and then you start replaying wall files up to that moment. And then PostgreSQL eventually reaches a consistent state and starts up. And you can query that server. But you need both ba uh, base backups and wall, and wall files. The cool thing of Barman is that it actually associates every wall file to the closest base backup. So if you, for example, erase or delete this base backup, you don't erase these wall files, but they are associated to the previous one transparently. And if you remove the, la the, the oldest base backups, all this stream of wall files up to here is automatically deleted for you. I was saying managing backups over time, of course, this backup catalog keeps growing and uh, following the principle of automation you would like to uh, automatically prune the backup catalog uh, specifying a way to do it possibly you could, could have for instance storage needs or low requirements that tell you that you can't store any data older than six months for example for low requirements. So Barman can remove obsolete backups and by defining one option, essentially, that 
could be defined globally or overridden at server level. You essentially have two options, one based on the number of backups, so you can type redundancy four, which means that you can keep the last four backups. Or recovery window of four weeks, three months, and Barman calculates automatically the, the point of recoverability uh, defined by this recovery window retention policy and automatically discards obsolete backups. So it's very easy to set up, set up highly configurable, and once again fully automated. <coughs> In case your, your database has a large por portion of data that doesn't change between a full base backup and the, subse and the subsequent one, you might benefit from, you can see that well, but from incremental backup. So incremental backup has been introduced in 1.4.0, so last month, and uh, it's a file-based incremental backup. It heavily relies on rsync and hard links and uh, it can reduce disk usage, so you can save space, you can save network bandwidth, and we can reduce backup time as well. The average, of course, on, on the customers that have this, you know, this specific um, workload that I described before, is between 50 to 70% reductions. So I'll show you later on a, a case study about incremental backup. We actually tried to introduce incremental backup uh, into Postgres 9.4 for PG-based backup, but we couldn't make it, so we'll, we'll, try, and we'll try harder for 9.6. Barman, can, uh, Barman allows you to uh, set up compression of wall files. So, um, you know, the first step is to set up archive command, archive command, sorry, continuous archiving. Without continuous archiving, we don't have physical backup in place. So, Bar uh, um, Postgres continuously sends wall files as soon as they, uh, the 16 megabytes uh, of transactional data are filled, sends them to, to Barman in a special directory called incoming. Then through the cron uh, command, Barman cron, which, which is the maintenance command for Barman, um, if you have requested it, Wall files can be compressed using gzip, bzip2, or your favorite compressor. And they are placed into the wall archive, the one we saw before. So when you, when you perform a backup, which is a very simple command, it's barman backup, backup name of the server, the, the uh, rsync copies the base backups, while Postgres keeps sending wall files in the incoming directory. Usually, if you, if you install Barman uh, with RPM or Ubuntu packages, Barman cron is set to run every minute. So every minute, the maintenance job runs, which takes incoming files, compresses them, and place them, stores them permanently in the archive. Without monitoring, we believe that you can't, you, can't have a, you can't have a business continuity solution. Sorry about that, but monitoring is a crucial part of managing a PostgreSQL database and any system. So with Barman, we, we wanted to be able to automatically detect any problem and immediately notify us of, 
about this promise so that we could act and solve the issue. So we, we didn't want to invent anything special because following the principle of automation and integration, we wanted Barman to be integrated very easily in the monitoring solution that your company is adopting. Does it make sense? So there's one command which is called Barman check. You can type Barman check all and all the servers configured in Barman are checked sequentially. Or you can type Barman check name of the server and Barman will start checking that server and make sure that everything works. So in this case, SSH connection was not possible, so an error was triggered. So Barman check returns zero if everything is fine. Otherwise, it, it, it returns another, uh, another code. An interesting uh, feature as well is the so-called smelly backup. So let's say your, your, Barman, your, your uh, periodic backup command fails. Uh, okay, you, you set up a cron every Saturday at 4 a.m. and that Saturday you have a power outage and the backup is not taken. Barman, if you set backup maximum age one week, after one week it will start signaling through the Barman check command that backup maximum age is not okay. So your backup stinks. Okay, so you can actually uh, react and uh, manually start another backup for that server. With 9.4, we have integrated Barma with, uh, with a small patch that I wrote last year for 9.4, uh, which is the PG start archiver uh, st uh, view. So Barman is able to immediately detect if the archiving process is not working. And it is, also, it is also able to give you an important statistics, which is the wall generation rate of your server. We have also integrated uh, Barman check with Nagios and Itzinga. So if you type Barman um, dash dash Nagios, uh, you have a fully compliant Nagios um, output. In this case, SSH was failing, so it returns two. So it's very easy to integrate Barman with, with Nagios. Other minor features is, you know, we, we can limit, limit bandwidth usage globally per server or table space. Can you give me an example why reducing bandwidth for table space could be useful? It, well, it's mainly for, let's say, if you have a table space on an SSD disk, you, may, you might want, for example, not to impact, you know, in, in, in pr on the production environment in terms of read and write operations on, on, on that disk or on the cache. Okay, so you can set it globally per server or per table space. You can also enable network compression so if you have a Barman server sitting on the other side of the world, you can compress your data before shipping it through, through the internet. Or if you have uh, a standby and you don't want to uh, stress your master, you can install uh, the PG Espresso uh, extension and backup from a standby. Uh, you can use hook scripts. Hook scripts are scripts that you can execute before or after the execution of some commands, for example, a backup or the, archive, the archival of a wall file. And we'll see some examples of file listing. I mean, you can get the list of all the files of a backup. But let's get to the most interesting part of this talk, according to me, which is... Um, 
the um, I mean I will unveil some um, important I think use cases for the first time and they involve uh, also the PostgreSQL database they are Italian companies but two of them operate worldwide so I'll start with the first one which is Job Rapido. Job Rapido is a, a job seeking website that is is present uh, in I think about about 60 countries in the world. It was founded in 2006 and it, it's been one of the most successful startups in in the Italian recent history. This is their architecture. They have several PostgreSQL servers. I mean, through an initial consulting activity, they, they were looking for sharding their single database into several shards, each one responsible for uh, a different country. So speaking with them, I'm talking to them, I said, why do you need sharding? I mean, do you really need it? Do you have intra country uh, relationships or way to, do you need to perform queries between different countries? I said, no, and so you don't need it. Why don't you shard by country by having different servers? So by placing each country in a different database and play, I mean move them according to the workloads. Doing this they saved a lot of money and they came up with a very simple architecture. At the moment, because they migrated in 2013, they only have master and disaster recovery nodes. They have 14 PostgreSQL servers spread in two different uh, data centers. They have 64 databases and around 650 gigabytes of data. So it's not a large database, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, let's say it's a medium-sized database. Okay, and of course they have monitoring in place. What is that? Monitoring. So uh, it's Inga uh, in, and Munin in place. So they have two backup uh, servers here that constantly and continuously backup all the PostgreSQL servers. It's very simple. So the largest database is 104 gigabytes, so they backup this database daily. The backup time is two hours and ten minutes. Uh, they use uh, virtual servers and in some cases also physical servers in the cloud. So they don't have servers in their premises. They produce about 6,000 world files a day. So about four, four an hour, no, four an hour, no it doesn't make sense, for a minute. Yeah, no, two minutes. Yeah, yeah. 1,400 minutes yeah. a day. Yeah, so that, that's a mistake. And the compression ratio for wall files is 70%. So every wall file is, on average, compressed 70%. This is what they, they want, to go, uh, want to go. They want to add geo-redundancy into <coughs> Barman. So basically have another Barman node in this data center continuously and asynchronously uh, cloned from the master. So this way we can, and I'll show this feature later on. Then we have Navionics. Navionics is, if, if you have a boat, I don't have it, but if you have a boat, most likely you have uh, an Avionics GPS or, or an app you know, a mobile app. And they are considered the leaders in this, in this sector in, in the world. They have the largest marine database and it's stored in Postgres. So in 2011, they decided to move away from Oracle because of costs, essentially. So they, they moved to 8.4 and uh, they couldn't, you know, there was not uh, streaming replication at the time. 
they mainly had one master and went into production with that. Then they called us and we started to work on Barman, thanks to them. But now they've moved to 9.4 and if you, if you have read the release notes of Navionics, of PostgreSQL 9.4, you, the, Navionics is mentioned. They, they waited, uh, they postponed their migration which was set to 9.3 to 9.4 because of logical decoding. So their, their main database, and now the cluster is 10.8 terabyte, but until, I mean, two mo last month it was 14 terabytes. Sorry. This is their architecture. So we, they have monitoring, one master server, and a backup server. So they are aware that if something goes wrong, they have to restore those 10 terabytes from scratch. But now that they have 9.4, they, they can think about the future. Okay, it's the next slide. But the server size is 10.8 terabytes. They back up the database weekly. Backup time is around 20 hours. And the, the duplication ratio is about 43%. So they save 5.7 terabytes out of 10.8 terabytes every week. So this is an example why, in some cases, file-based incremental backup could be useful. I, I struggle to say nav to Navionics that file-based incremental backup is not useful. When they save 20 hours a week of backup time, reduce by 50% network bandwidth, and also disk usage. Uh, they produce 90,000 walls per week, which is an average of nine wall files per minute, which is not bad. And compression ratio is about 30%. So these are numbers that you can quote if you want. You can use if you, if you need to, uh, you know, marry the PostgreSQL uh, codes, you can use these numbers. An interesting uh, feature that we have developed for them and that uses hook scripts is the weekly uh, backup on tapes. So it's a semi-automated process. Thanks to a hook script, they uh, use the barman list files command joint with tar and they produce two files. One is a standalone backup, which they can pretty much copy uh, in a, on a recovery node and start up. And the PostgreSQL server starts um, on a consistent, consistent state um, uh, of the moment the backup ended. Okay. And then all the world files from the start of the uh, backup to the start of the following one are uh, placed into this tar, uh, tar file. Then, you know, tar works perfectly with tapes. They put that on tapes manually because they need an operator that does that operation, but that's fine. And they ship those uh, tapes to Italy because it's much faster through Express Courier. So they have a copy in Italy of the database. The database is in India, as, a, as I was showing before. So the future, you know, they have a very simple architecture, but obviously they need standbys. So they will add sync rep, evaluate rep manager. They will definitely work on logical decoding because now, I mean, that's the heart of the database, but then they have replication with Londist that creates several publishing servers that are used by the applications. They will move everything to logical decoding. Then cascading replication, for example, they can use stream replication and have a server in Italy that is pretty much instantly uh, synchronized with, with, uh, with the master, and then cascading backup. Now, subito, subito.it few 
stop an Italian person uh, and you ask them about Subito, they, they know what you're talking about. Subito, which means at once, you know, is, is a, operates in the classified media advertising sector and basically they, they outruled eBay in the Italian market. So if you want to sell something, a bike, a house, or you want to hire somebody, you put that ad on, uh, on subito.it. These are some numbers. This is the most visited website in Italy in 2014 in its category. And it's the sixth most visited website in Italy after Google, Facebook, and Subito. Okay, this is the sixth website. Five million classified ads per c category and geographic range. Over eight million unique users per month and 30 million page visits per day. You imagine oh, how many shards they have. What's their architecture? So they, they've, already, they've always been in Postgres since, uh, I mean, using A3, and last year we moved, we moved them to 9.3. They have uh, Red Hat 6, 1.4 terabyte. The peak is 400 transactions per second, and at night, as you see, this is the workload. Fortunately, because it's a time zone influenced market, um, they, have, they can afford downtimes at night. Okay, so they don't operate 24-7. So this is their architecture. They have one master, standby, a backup server, and then reporting and staging servers. And this is what I will be covering in, in a minute. So this two hours and 45 minutes is the backup time. 800 gigabytes reused every day. Five World files per minute uh, is, it is what, what they generate on average, considering also the downtime, the, the, you know, the mm, low workload. I will detail, I will give you details about the automated recovery uh, solution that they have implemented. They have a reporting database that is generated from scratch every day automatically using the last back, uh, backup. So it's a totally disjointed server so that they can, they can use it also for writes. And every day it's completely erased and regenerated. This is the best outcome for, for Subito.ic. Subito.ic is 100% sure that the backups effectively, effectively work every day. So we have implemented for them a post backup script that, you know, after the initial checks, creates a restore point uh, on the master server, stop the Postgres server on the recovery node, recover Bauman to, the last, to that target, which is also incremental because you are recovering on an existing data directory. They customize the configuration because they use different RAM and different disk, et cetera. They start the Postgres server. They wait for Postgres to exit the recovery mode. And then they customize the instance. They create users, they create tables, they create whatever they want. And then they enjoy it and they let the marketing department enjoy the, the, this database. It takes around six hours now, but we're planning to, to improve it. So again, they are thinking about moving to 9.4, adding more servers, and evaluating sync rep and rep manager. So the last part, the road ahead. So this is what we would like to implement in Barman this and next year, and everything is subject to, of course, private funding. So we normally operate this way. We, we receive funding from private companies that want, you know, that have specific needs, 
we develop them and we put them in the open source product. You know, as a, as a business, we have to sustain our activities and pay us, pay all, you know, all the programmers. We would like to work for free, but I guess nobody works for free, right? So these are the first two uh, features we would like to work on. Mm, the most important one, I must admit, is the PG-based backup copy method support. So rather than having only our sync, we want to implement the ba PG-based backup support, which unlocks PostgreSQL on Windows support. If we implemented the tar copy method, you know, each one of uh, any of them will unlock S3 storage stra uh, strategy. So whichever we implement first, we will be able to work on S3 storage. Then, again, if w otherwise, if we implement tar storage, we can have base backup compression. So let's say you're interested, uh, uh, David is interested in base backup encryption. You know, I say, okay, yeah, David, you are interested in that. The shortest way is for us to implement tar storage uh, and then base backup compression, which uh, unlocks base backup encryption. Otherwise, we can implement PG-based backup and then S3 storage, etc. if you're interested in S3. Another interesting feature is the get wall facility. You know, if you set up a, a standby server, you have to set up also the restore command. So currently, Barman has to ship every wall files beforehand to the destination node. If a smarter way to do that would be to actually allow the recovery node to query Barman and ask for the get for, for, for the wall file that it's needed. So through the get wall uh, command, we, will, we would be able to do that. And also, this would allow you to set up cbarman as a hub of wall files for all your PostgreSQL infrastructure. So you can reduce the wall keep segment, or you can use, you know, a, a different, in a different way, uh, replication slots. If you set this um, fallback methodology for uh, recovery, so you can set it, even if you have streaming replication, if there's a, you know, a connection problem, Postgres tries the, the restore command. And the same way on, the, on another node. So they are crossed, there's a crossed uh, synchronization. And also this opens uh, the door to cascading backups. Then you can export backups and re-import them again into Barman. This is another feature that we would like to implement using TAR, of, of course. But, you know, there's more. Windows support, if you, if you want to use Barman on Windows. Keep and no keep of backups. So you can, you can um, make sure that protect a backup from retention policies. Backup scheduling, the grandfather and father and son backup scheme, recovery nodes, etc. So if you if you're interested, I mean we can talk later on. Um, I'll be at the second quadrant uh, desk. Just a quick overview of some similar tools that you can find because Barman is not the only one. So if you're planning to use a disaster recovery, look all of them and decide which one suits. Uh, better for, for your needs. All of them are open source, uh, but uh, as far as I know, it's an enterprise DB product. I don't think it's, it's open source, but I might be wrong. This is the DevOps team that, that con continuously develop Barman. We implement, yeah, DevOps, the DevOps culture, as I call it. It's myself, Marco, Giulio, Francesco, and Giuseppe. And behind there's our Kanban board where we, you know, measure the, 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 the progress of every feature we implement. We have about 
uh, 8,000 unit tests and 1,500 integration tests that we run every time we implement a new feature. And every feature is uh, reviewed by at least three people. Because when it comes to disaster recovery, we can't make mistakes, okay? My advice is to start simple, then grow. This is valid for everything. Start simple, evaluate RPO, RCO, costs, and most importantly, risks. It, it must not be a technological re uh, uh, reason, but uh, assessed by all these four things. Have a disaster recovery plan. Update it regularly and make sure that everyone knows about it because when the disaster happens, you'll be on holiday. <laughs> okay, you don't want to be cold when you're on holiday. Always test and simulate. Uh, you can implement the chaos monkey paradigm, so destroy a master or, you know, shut down a master or, you know, I've seen it doing with barman and restoring that. Because practice is the only way to mastery. So make sure that regularly you, you test your backups and you simulate a disaster. So finally, <coughs> Bauman is, a, is robust, I believe, maintained and tested. We followed these three principles. I hope you, you got an idea of, three of the three of them. Integration, usability, and automation. Monitoring and alerting are crucial components of your system. We also believe that Oracle has, uh, I mean, Bauman has fostered migrations from Oracle, has reduced barriers for migrations. That's what we, we are continuously told by leads especially. But most importantly, because we manage over a thousand database servers with second quadrant, it has standardized our support procedures. So we know that most of our customers have Bauman in place. So when there's a disaster, all the engineers know what to do. And this is important because if you have thousand databases and each of them has their own custom scripts, when the disaster happens, you're under stress, it's unexpected, could be at night, <coughs> Yet there's a lot of emotional uh, situations that occur, so you have to deal with them as well. So I would like to hear about your story. You know, I'm here, as I said, all day. I would like to hear what you think of Varman, whether it's good or bad, like David. So it's, I'm quite open to that. So I don't think we have questions to Question start. Can we have some questions, at least one? Any questions? I'll talk to you. Oh, you talk to yeah. me. Okay. Any questions? The yes. Backup, if you want to restore, does it go the full backup, then the incremental, then the wall file? No, no, it's transparent. So the incremental is managed by your hard links. So you don't, you don't notice that. No, it's between the start of the backup and the end of the backup. You need all of them, otherwise it's not consistent. Because the assumption is that uh, a page, a disk page can change its content between the moment you start a backup and the moment the backup ends. Okay, and changes are written in the world files. That's why you need them. Yeah, the first time you can recall, if, if, if that's, you know, your first backup, the, f the minimum time, point in, t uh, point in time, is the start of the backup. No, actually, no, no, what, uh, it's the end of the backup, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you need a previous one to recover, yeah. It starts from the previous one. 
Okay. No, it's not differential. It's basically you take, t it's like you take uh, the two snapshots and you compare the two of them file per file. And if all your files have changed, you know, you don't share anything. But you share all the single files that have not changed between the two base backups. Okay, so if, if you touch all the files, like if you perform a vacuum or something like that, you, you don't have... So it is at the file level, not at the At file level, yes. So in case of point-in-time recovery, does it uh, recover up to the point, what is the unit? Is it up to the second or is it up uh, to you the... Can, a, a, it's driven by Postgres. So you can have uh, time, transaction ID, or target name. So the, the example I showed you before for subito.it, before restoring, they, they tag, they place a placeholder in the database. It's called restore point. So you can specify that at recovery time, and PostgreSQL stops there at replay time. OK, no worries. No, at the moment it's not stored compressed. It's, uh, it's on the, the storage uh, me method is plain. So you have plain files. But if you use, for example, ZF, ZFS, Z, F, ZFS, yeah, you know, it's transparent. <laughs> That's the best way, I think. You know, the, the, all the, I mean, the three, I, I explained the three principles. The fourth is, you know, it's not to reinvent the wheel. So if there's something else that does that job brilliant in it, brilliantly and it's well maintained, we stick with that. We don't want to re-implement everything in, uh, in our software. You can compress the world files. You, like. you can compress world files. And as I said, if you want to compress backup files, we need to have at least either the tar storage uh, feature unlocked or the S3 storage. That way you can store on S3 in a compressed manner and encrypt it. When, when's your expectation for releasing a compressed backup, or excuse me, encrypted backup? It depends if, if it's, it's driven by private funding. Mm. You know, eh? Yeah, if you... <laughs> generally we try to uh, cut all those features in a three month period so that every feature could be uh, a new release. So, and three months doesn't mean that it takes us three months to develop that because development time is usually quite short. If, we, if there's 10 hours development, there's 90 hours <coughs> testing. And plus you have documentation and, you know, when, when we develop an open source tool, we have to emphasize on documentation, on writing manuals. You have all the man pages. So if you type man, barman, you get, you know, all the uh, options for barman, man five barman, the configuration options. And uh, so we try and write standard applications as much as we can. And, and you know, easy to install. So if you want to install it on Ubuntu, you type apt, apt get install barman and it's, it's installed. Or RP, yum install barman and it's installed on Red Hat. And another important thing is that so far, you can upgrade from any version of barman to the latest one and everything is compatible. So you, you don't need to worry about internal formats uh, of data files or things like that. You can update transparently. And we always encourage to up update to the latest version. So right now I use um, compressed PG dumps for backups. Um, and so they, they're a lot smaller. If, if I want to switch to using Barman and you know, get all the, the nicer features and not have custom scripts doing things, I should expect that I'll need a lot more disk space, <laughs> right? Yeah, you have, I mean, the, the difference is made up by indexes. Right. 
Okay, because indexes take zero, like five, five words in a, an SQL dump. I could say uh, gigabytes on disk. Right. You know, so that that's mainly the the difference you get. But the difference is, you have continuous backup here. Mm. With PG dump, you have to take into uh, you have to consider RPO because the recovery point objective is uh, basically could be in the worst case scenario uh, the time between two PG dumps. Right. That's where we have streaming replication. So and but that's right, yeah. if, if that's fine, but streaming replication doesn't. That's a that's a tri that's you know mainly the difference between disaster recovery and high availability. As as uh, what, what's the name? What? Nine. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I can't. She was pointing out before with nine four you have delayed standbys, mm -hmm. and they can protect you from human errors. If you have synchronous replication and you type drop table, yeah. <laughs> you can have as many standbys you want, but it's. No. Yeah, but still, you know, if it, if it's all you it's type delete, yeah. delete from without where, you know, and you know, yeah. it's a, it's a yeah. similar use case. So that's a disaster recovery solution uh, with continuous backup also covers that. Replication doesn't cover that case. It covers, and it's mo mostly a high availability um, feature. So high availability and disaster recovery together, you have business continuity. Mm -hmm. So this is, and you need both of them. And disaster recovery, to conclude, is the primordial way of doing high availability. Whereas with mm -hmm. high availability, you can't do disaster recovery. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the most simple solution you can have, you have a disaster recovery solution, as you've seen in these examples. Mm -hmm. So here you have some URLs and uh, if you have questions I'm, I'm here as I said at the second quadrant stand. I, these slides are uh, publicly available and these are some commands which are very very simple to understand. It's R sync. No, 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 no. It's R sync that will do its best to finish the backup in the shortest time possible. Yeah, but I the backup command needs to copy all the pages of the you know, all the data files in the PG data and the table spaces. So by default, it's performed at the highest uh, speed. But you can limit that through the bandwidth limit option, as I said before. So you don't, if you want to reduce the impact on the, mainly the operating system cache, you can, you can configure bandwidth limitation. You you want to go you want to eat <laughs>